Good morning and welcome to this week's Valentine's oh, Valentine's all the recruitment lovers out there Valentine's special but no it's actually Wednesday it's the recruitment discussion with Jump so thank you very much for attending and this week we're discussing talent attraction we're all talented recruiters but can we recruit talent so again I'm going to sort of throw some sort of stats at us according to a survey by Safris this is on 2022-2023. The findings reveal that 7% of firms have an attrition rate greater than 40% in the recruitment market, while only a third of agencies have a report a 32% attrition rate and less than 10% of the market have less than 10% attrition rate. And this was taken from 2019 all the way through 2022. So on average, what they found is that 22% of recruiters leave within the first 12 months of, of employment, but smaller firms have made better progress with less than 5% leaving or in the first year in 2022-23. However, the impact of the cost of hiring, after all, we've got to think about the cost, Replacing a highly trained employee costs between 120% of their annual salary, growing up to 200%. And according to some sources, it's nearer 400%. According to Pertbox, despite the year-on-year -year growth, the recruitment industry has a whopping 43% attrition rate. So there's a bit of conflict between Pertbox's view and Safari's view, where the national average is 15%. And some general stats with regarding headcount that we should really take heed of. 80% of employees leave due to a bad hiring decision. So they've chose a bad company or been sold something bad within the recruitment process. It takes up to two years for a new hire to match the productivity of a tenured employee. According to the survey, 31% of 1,000 employees quit in the first six months for different but affordable or avoidable reasons. And companies that support flexible hours and remote working conditions have a 25% lower turnover rate. And 65% of employees believe that they can find a position offering higher pay, which gives them more confidence to leave their job without a fear. And the top reasons for people leaving at the moment are 31.5% career advancement, 22.4% pay and benefits, 20.2% lack of fit, 16.5% management, 7.5% flexibility, and 1.7% job security. So it's a wide mix. Today we've got the full, full people on today from the from Jump. Everyone's here, which is great. Okay, so I'm going to dive in straight in for the questions. Okay. Feel free to ask and challenge if anybody on anything from there, because it's going to be quite an interesting conversation. So in today's competitive market, how do recruitment agencies differentiate themselves to attract top tier talent to work for them? I think it's about image. I, I actually think this is about how you create separation in your business, um, about your business from your competitors. And I think this is kind of a deep subject because it, it, it talks to vision, the vision of your business, where you're taking it, you represent your values, your behaviors, um, it talks about uh, how long people stay with you, the tenure of people with your organization, their career paths, their development. So every part of the business, no, regardless of whether it's the website or it's your LinkedIn presence as a business or the LinkedIn presence of each of your people uh, or social media presence of everybody connected to the company, it's everything that, that I suppose is exposed about your organization to the public and indeed to your competitors. You're understanding your EVP, your employer value proposition and positioning it correctly and consistently will add real value to your organization in terms of attracting and retaining people. You, you make a couple of comments there, Howard, about why people leave jobs, why they join other companies and career opportunities very high up there. Interestingly, job security very low. I thought it was just less than 2%. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that the fact is that if people believe in what you believe in as an organization, if, they, if their values align with yours as a business, and if they can see very visibly, and indeed with the people they speak to, outstanding career opportunities, then they're likely to work for you. Money you've mentioned there, but I see that as less important 
and offering people a purpose in their careers. Paul, I, I, I do agree with you that that employee value proposition and the branding and the you know that um, alignment with everything on LinkedIn and all the different channels and stuff is is really important. But it also is a real danger. It's a trap that organizations fall into, which is to create this externally facing brand that then when people arrive and start working for them is just so aspirational as to be ridiculous. And so you actually will have higher turnover if you create an employer brand that doesn't reflect what actually happens in the organization because you create a set of expectations that the organization uh -huh. cannot live up to. And so there's a real danger that your your brand, your externally facing brand has to reflect what yeah. your organization actually is like. So there's and, and, no and point I, in claiming yeah. set of values that you don't espouse. And I completely agree with that. And I, you know, maybe I didn't say it as clearly, but I, your EVP, a true EVP, is the fact that your external um, stance, your external positioning, is exactly or very close to what the experience is to work in the organisation. You're absolutely right. If you sell somebody a glossy brochure, and then when they get there, they find that they've been misled, then clearly they're going to be very disgruntled. So you're completely right. I mean, you it's not just get the higher turnover, yeah. right? Yeah. You get high over turnover absolutely. in that, in that case. Yeah, if it, if if they don't match, yeah, but it's something I think people miss. Or, so you don't get that understanding. That an EVP is about holding yourself to account as just as much as it is about promoting your organisation. Sorry, Dave, yeah, I talked. It's interesting. No, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I've I've been interviewing on behalf of one of our clients who is looking for um, a senior person to take on a role. And I've seen five candidates. And I was asking them, what's got them to this stage? So they were keen to meet the seniors of the company that's trying to hire them, and then reflect back on the company's website and on Glassdoor and on LinkedIn to see how many people have joined and left. So in doing their analysis of the company, what they're wanting to balance is I like the guy because he or she is a good interviewer, yeah, as in from the company. But actually, what do other people say about them? How how are they holding on to their staff? What are they involved in? To your point, Paul, about um, trust and positioning, but looking elsewhere to find out that information. So I think in answer to your question how about how, you've got to get, you, if you are verbalising an interview, about what you do and what you say and how you live your values yeah is that true in how you position yourself on linkedin on your website on your referrals whatever it may be because if there's a disjoint there then the people you're trying to attract will pick that up and you may not get them so i think and, and interesting the glass line. doors are really interesting wasn't it because i i personally i really dislike glass door i've had a bad experience yeah, with them as an yeah, organization I've seen them. but people really do use it yeah. so yeah, and I, I don't it like it searching ever. and yeah uh, for, for all my personal dislike of it you really do need to pay attention to how your organization is being presented on glass door people candidates look at it yeah and, and also heather they take uh, it becomes a bigger factor in their decision Yes. than personally I think you should yes that's <laughs> true because they believe it has credibility with candidates it has face credibility yeah. I, personally I think it's an awful awful business but there you go <laughs> but it's, it, but it's an interesting I, isn't I, it that, you, it's interesting though isn't it because you've got clients that you know will look at that and when you come to sort of look at a company the first thing people do is google the company yeah. So they're going to get Glassdoor yeah. and they're going to get Google reviews. So if candidates are giving a very, very different you know, story to their experience compared to what the glossy brochure is actually saying, then it seems to switch people off. And I think we've got to understand that. And I think mm -hmm. it's very important that you know, that touch and feel of when you walk into an office, does it mirror and match what you're talking about? And I think if you want to get that differentiator, I think it's when you set that up and you have that done correctly but then when people come into interview you have that conversation that takes them all the way through all of their career yeah 
Uh, and, and therefore having all of their career laid out in front of them, having all the business plans laid out in front of them so they can see where the business is starting from and where the business is going and what their journey in with that business and how it's going to do that. And if you start to think that the biggest change since lockdown is that, you know, 31.5% of people are leaving business because of career development. So if you can't explain what that career development looks like, then people are going to go to places where career development is. And I remember sort of you know, in my own business as a small business bringing people in, I said, why have you chosen us over some of the bigger players in, in, the, in the market that we were in? And they all said, because you sat there and laid out a plan of how I am going to grow and prosper and what the company is going to do to help me get there. And I think we've got to start to think that it's not about us, it's about them. And too many agencies are still, it's all about us, look at us, look at us, look at us, as you'd be glad to join us, where it's not, it's the other way around. And so yeah. I think looking at what that career advancement would be, how that then links the pay and benefits, et cetera, then enables you to look at, is that a lack of fit? Because that's what people do. They come in, they see all these glossy things, and when they get there, that fit doesn't happen. And so mm. they leave. So I think we've got to start to think about how we can change that and what we do to change that. So moving on to the next question then. So what innovative strategies or tools do you recommend for identifying and engaging with passive candidates who may not be actively seeking new opportunities? Now, I think and I especially want to talk about the contract people and the temp people who are very locked in with their books rather than just the perm people. So what strategies would you put in place to identify the passive marketplace? You know, this is a this is a really interesting one. I think um, the first thing I think you really have to accept is this is a long term game. Yeah. So it's very, very difficult to attract passive candidates in that market quickly. So you've got to be paying attention to it all of the time. So one of the first first things I would do is make pipelining people like that, those game changing hires. Pipelining those should be the responsibility of a lot of people in your organization. So depending, you can choose who it is, but there should be a lot of people involved in pipelining those people and it, and understand that to bring a game changing hiring like that can take 12, 18 months of, of work. It is not a quick thing at all. So um, so that, that would be my first thing is make it part of somebody or a group of people's job all the time so all every week they should be expected to make movements towards attracting those people into the business and understand that this is very very long term very long term. I, I, you've taken the words right out of my mouth I, I thought the interesting question here was innovative and i was thinking about this thinking well is it innovative the thing is we um we always talk on this uh, on these webinars about attracting candidates, using your database, your candidate database, keeping people engaged with your brand and so forth. Um, you tend to find in our industry that people become uh, within the businesses uh, that we work with very active, very animated when they need somebody to have a vacancy. And suddenly there's a great deal of action and activity to try to find people through advertising and reaching out to passive candidates, to use that expression. And I couldn't agree more with Heather. I think that what you have to do is understand that getting people to join your business is a long game and that you should be regularly meeting up for coffees or drinks or whatever with certain people that you maybe know from your past or others around you know from their, their, their past um, or indeed people you've identified as competitors. That isn't necessarily that you're looking for an immediate win, that they're going to come and join you immediately, but you are working on them, as it were, over, it's a charm offensive, over a period Absolutely. of time. And it takes a long time, right, yeah. to build that relationship and build that trust in you that when they finally make a leap, that they're making the right one. They've got, they, you know, you they're, because they're generally comfortable where they are. That's so right. you've, got, yeah. you've got to be at the forefront of their mind at the point at which they're vulnerable to a move. And they've got to have built that relationship of trust with you to know that you're consistent in what you're saying and that and that it's happened over a long period of time. Well, they're not and, gonna, and You're right, Heather. And then if they're witnessing success in your business, and of course, if you catch them at the right moment, yeah. um, suddenly things have changed in their business. I don't know. The boss has changed. There's a change of direction. And now they're disgruntled or unhappy. Bingo. Now your opportunity is there. But it's not happened uh, by sheer coincidence or accident. It's happened because you've been in touch with that person for some considerable period of time. 
And there's so an the, interesting thing about this from the other side, which is that our successful people are vulnerable to this approach. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got to be on it all the time because correct. This, so I think be there's a comment here that needs to be made though that you know we're pushing this outwards constantly, and we're looking at you know how we advertise to them, how we market to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think we seem to forget what the biggest marketing tool that we have is. And I remember interviewing somebody to come and work for me back in my Lorian days. And I said, why are you coming to work for me? You're established a good recruiter. And her comment was from the old Tetley Bitter advert, if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> and we had spent months competing against each other. And she said, every time I came up against any client, you were there. You were there. You were there. You were constantly there. Every time I spoke to my client about you, no one ever had a bad word to say. And that was the thing that we, we sort of worked at as a, as a group within the, the business was delighting your clients because your clients become very good advocates of what's going on. But then doing exactly what you were talking about, Heather, then about tracking the right people and pushing into the right people so at the right time you could get them. But a lot of that clients and candidates and consultants talk to each other and they talk to you about other agencies and how those other agencies work. So, again, it's back to that. If yeah. it's not a mirror and match situation, you know, oh, they've got this lovely glowing out exterior outlook. But when I speak to the consultants, they're all vile, et cetera. Then, yeah. again, it just switches people off. So the biggest advocate, I think, of, you know, that innovative strategy is treat your clients and your candidates really, really well outperform your competition and give your competition nowhere else to go other than yourself and i think that's the bit especially when you're looking at that contract and temp market sometimes you can overcome that money law by the quality of service that you're providing and if you're everywhere that they are and more and everywhere that they look then it makes a very very hard decision for them to leave but an easy decision when they can demonstrate that the mirror and match is exactly what it should be. And, and by the way, your clients couple... and candidates will lead you to your competitors who are doing a great job. If you ask yeah. the right question, they will yeah. tell you who those great consultants exactly. are. Yeah, they definitely will. Sorry, Dave, my apologies. I was say that a couple of things for me. Um, one, your best hirers are the people who work for you yeah. and getting references. And if you think, Oh no, I'm not sure what they'd say. Start there. Because if your own people can't articulate professionally and well what it's like to work for you, then your retention rate is not going to be very good. Because even if you manage to get them in, they may not stay. So make sure that what you're doing is the right thing by the people you've already got before you start hiring. Because if the people that you've already got are prepared to say good things, well-meaning, and they genuinely mean it, then they will be effervescent. It will be infectious. They will want other people to come and work for, for your company. Yeah. So get it right internally. And the yeah. other thing, Paul, and you just alluded to it, and it's not innovative at all, ask your clients. Yeah. Ask your clients, who do they get really good service from and why? And then go and find them. Yeah. So let's move that on then. So how can recruitment agencies that ensure diversity and inclusion are prioritised through the, that talent acquisition process? Because obviously that is now a really high agenda item for a lot of our end clients, but also for when people are moving into your business. And if ever there was a Heather question, this is it, I think. Yeah. Do you know what, Paul, though? That's part of the problem, I Right. Yeah. The assumption is that, well, <laughs> conclusion, there must be HR. And actually, my answer is it's not HR. It, it is an HR and it's got to be everybody. Yes. So the only way you ensure diversity and inclusion are prioritised is that everybody in the organisation understands it, understands it, is bought into it, gets it, can talk about it, lives it, breathes it. And it isn't a HR. Sorry to be provocative there. <laughs> no, no, it's no, you're absolutely right. It's about educating everybody and making sure everyone um, demonstrates and, the, the right behaviours. You're completely and you know, right. One of the most important things you can do, actually, is, and I do, I do a lot of training with recruitment businesses to improve their hiring um, and to improve their recruiting. And one of the first things is for them to really understand what it is they're looking for so that they can then do away with 
the questions that they ask and the criteria they've got that are irrelevant. Because of the number of people I come across who have the most ridiculous questions that they ask because they think that that's, you know, that's an indicator of success. And that's not HR at all, right? It's do you understand what good looks like and sounds like? And do you know how to ask for it? Do you know how, do you recognise it when you see it? And it's not, what does your dad do for a living? <laughs> it's just, it's getting rid of that. And then obviously there's all the really good stuff that you need to do about really understanding about excluded groups and yeah. how so, that, you know, how you can work. Sorry, how does talking over you? No, so I'm going to throw a little spanner into this one then, just to sort of test the the, the water, okay? Because I find this a hard question to answer sometimes. Yes, yeah, we should be is. diverse. And yes, we should have diverse teams. But there's a lot of small recruitment ag agencies out there that are all male, all female, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when talent stands in front of them and it looks like everybody else in their business and it's good talent, what do they do? Do they take it then add to that non-diverse profile or do they reject that person? You know, because that's the bit when you start to grow an agency, you tend to recruit the same people that look like you, work like you, etc. And then it creates really hard for diversity. And then further down the line, you might find that you've already got seven, eight people that look like you, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you challenge that? Because I do find this a hard question for certain recruitment agencies. And you've got to take that step further yeah, back, but, right? So yeah. the problem isn't when you've got talent standing in front of you, right? Of course, you shouldn't reject that talent who's standing in front of you and is perfect for your business because they're the wrong gender right or they're from the wrong class background or they're the wrong class. you know you can't because they're not diverse i can't recruit them in that that's the wrong question the question is why are the only people who are standing in front of you that you think are talented are only from the same groups as the people yeah you're exactly with? that so you the question is actually one further back so are you looking in enough you know are you fishing in big enough pools are you putting things in the way of diverse candidates? So I've talked to recruitment businesses who say, I can't find any talent. I really can't find any talent. But they refuse to allow any kind of flexibility in working hours yep. and they refuse to allow working remotely. So you're excluding a huge group of people unnecessarily because you want people back at their desks five days a week, nine hours a day. So I, I think it's the wrong question, Howard. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to say something slightly controversial. Most of the companies that I talk to that aren't necessarily our clients, when DE and I comes up, they roll their eyes. Yeah. Still. And it's the most frustrating thing for me personally because it's a kind of passion. That it's, for me, it's the fabric of what our industry is about. So would they go to inner city schools? Would they go to women at home? Would they go to those that are um, uh, ex-military? Would They don't even look in those talent pools because as far as I can say, that's too much of a challenge. The bigger companies do, and most of the clients that we supply to do because they have either a target to hit or they socially they're much more aware but given that most recruitment companies have less than 10 people, that's too big a challenge to take on. So they just don't. Now, You've also got to... Me, that's not me criticising everybody. It's just me saying, actually, that there's a talent pool out there that people yep. just don't even dip into. And you're right. And I think the thing you've got to be very aware of is subconscious bias because, uh, back to Heather's point, are we excluding people based on what we've read on their CVs, for example? Is it to do with names, is it to do with backgrounds, class, as you've said? Is that actually going on? Are we, when we look at candidates for ourselves, are people around you um, sort of filtering out maybe even subconsciously people that don't fit uh, based on their own criteria? And I think you've got to look, and it's a deep subject, at how the process goes forward. And I think, again, picking up your point, Dave, are we advertising in certain media? Are we looking at certain websites to look for people? If we really mean to have a diverse workforce, what are you doing proactively? And I think this is about education, but it's also about attitudes within the business. There's a really good example of that, um, Paul. I might have mentioned it before. I apologise if I've done this before, but I worked with a small construction business that was very male, very white, very narrow age bracket. And they none, not a single person in that business would have discriminated deliberately. 
ever, but they did all their pipelining on LinkedIn and all the people they were connected with on LinkedIn were in other construction businesses who were all white and were all male and were all in a narrow age band. And so, of course, when they pipelined, the only people they were looking at. Of course. Was, so, uh, so one of the things I challenged them with was, right, for the next three months, only connect with people on LinkedIn that don't look like you. So go and go and connect with people who are a different age from you, who work in different sectors, different industries, um, who, you know, anything about them's got to be different from you. And let's just see what happens. So they didn't change their pipelining behavior. They just changed the people they were connecting with. And lo and behold, the next hire they made was a woman. First woman they'd recruited. In their <laughs> business, right? And a really talented woman yeah. came in and was a great part of the team. But it, it, all they had to do was stop fishing in different pools. So here's a question then, because we've talked, we touched this on in question one then. So what role does the employer branding play in attracting and retaining talent? And how can recruitment agencies build stronger employer brand to attract talent? I mean, that's sort of a, a, an advancement of the questions that we've already had. But let's push into that. I think you've got to be very careful. Uh, you know, just about every air, everything about your business that's exposed to the public. And let's face it, everything we do virtually by virtually minute by minute, we are exposing the business to the public, whether that's in terms of uh, the structure of our emails whether it's the website, whether it's our social media posts, uh, whatever we're doing is saying something about our behaviours and attitudes. We're, and not just in terms of the wording, but also the images we use on our website and on, on our social media posts and our videos and so forth. You have to really step back and take a look at what your business projects. Um, when we talk about employer branding, and you're talking, going back to the earlier question about inclusion and so forth, when you just took look at the look at it cold, look at your business cold, as if you were a client, as if you were a candidate. What does it say to you? And look at every area, every channel of your communications, both externally and internally, and ask yourself: Is it consistent with the values that you purport? That you know, we talk about being diverse, we talk about being inclusive, and I, like Heather said, I, I've never yet worked with anybody that, in any way, shape, or form concern me as being prejudiced or biased in any way. I wouldn't work with them, frankly. So I, I think that uh, everyone I've ever worked with and continue to work with are very open-minded and very decent human beings without a shadow of doubt. But when you look at what they project, is that consistent? And their people, is it consistent with the branding that they wish to, to, to put out there into the public domain? You've got to step back and take a good, cold, clinical look at everything you do through the channels you use. There's a really interesting thing, isn't there, I think, with this the, the part of this question to do with evolving expectations of candidates. One of the challenges, one of the recruitment businesses I've got, I'm working with at the moment, is, is struggling with, is that as they're hiring people into the business, experienced hires and some in operations roles, not in sales roles, there is an expectation that they want flexibility, the ability to work remotely from time to time. And this organisation is allowing that in order to hire those people in, but hasn't yet made the switch to allow that for their existing workforce. And they are they are storing up problems for themselves mm -hmm. because they're ending up with this two two tier workforce where new hires are being given flexibility and trust in a way that their existing workforce aren't. Um, and there's just starting to be some grumbles about it because it's just, you know, and that's going to be a bigger issue for more organisations. And it's about that consistency. You know, you tailoring your approach is all very well, but you've got to be consistent about what you're offering to hire yeah, yeah. as well as to the people who, who work for you. Well, consistency is such a strong word. I mean, it's come up in almost all the answers to, to the questions that we've got. Um, I think a lot of time as recruiters, we spend too much time talking about our brand and less time or not enough time talking about the person we're trying to interview. Yeah, one of the guys that I met this week for this interview process I'm doing um, said, you didn't sell me the dream you asked about me. The other three I saw sold me the dream. And I don't want the dream. I, I want a job in a place with people I'm going to enjoy working for. If the dream's there, I'll, I'll take it. But don't sell me the dream. Ask me about me. 
and I thought it was really interesting that we whether we will secure this person or not, I don't know, but we're at the final stages against two much, much bigger companies with really good branding and lots of awards and lots of success and a really good image. Um, but they sold on that rather than the person they were trying to attract. But I suppose, Dave, that's what branding's there for, isn't it? And branding's there to evoke that emotion to buy. That's what branding yeah. says. It, it evokes the emotion yeah. to buy. So we put it into our, our contacts. It evokes the emotion to for, to come for the interview and have the interview. And what you're testing when you get through to that interview process is whether or not that branding is mirror and matched. So if you're then just yeah. pushing that branding down their throat and not actually asking any questions of them that you care about people, that et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then it doesn't show that, does it? It doesn't it doesn't mirror and match. Yeah. And I think that's the bit that you're talking about is that the branding is get, getting them through the door. Once they're in the door, it's how you keep them in the office and keeping them in the office is all about them and about and their the journey. The behaviour of the system. hiring managers, Howard, as well. Because yeah. if the people yeah. who are conducting those interviews aren't reflecting your branding and your values and they're not trained and they're providing a poor experience you know well, you've wasted all your branding yes and I, right. I, I, I saw that with a client that i was working with a, a, a you know a number of years ago that when we went through the first interview the person doing the first interview was not the best person to have them in there but they yeah. had them in there because they thought well they're the hardest person in the recruitment agency there yeah they're, 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 they're this 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 and this and I said yeah but look at what you're selling to the person at the other side you're selling this ogre you know that has nothing to do with this person he's never going to interview this person it was really interesting that once we took that person out we start to get some really good people into the business yeah. and once we got some really good people into the business the business move forward very very yeah. quickly so but it is i've seen a lot of businesses who where the owner operator of that business wants to keep hold of that role and they want to gatekeep all the hires in yeah. and that's a sure fire way to actually limit your ability to grow your business if you can't have people in your organization you trust to do that well for you yeah, yeah. you're never going to grow but we've touched on this as well. So in light of the evolving expectation of candidates, particularly regarding sort of work-life balance and career growth, how do recruitment agencies tailor their approach then to effectively communicate their value proposition of job opportunities, prospecting talent, etc.? cetera? How do, how do recruitment agencies do that? Um, look, I think this is a very difficult question. Um, the, and you, we talked about it earlier. Uh, and uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, Heather mentioned this that you know if you are wanting to sort of grow your talent pool, then you have to consider um, people working from home, work from home situations, shorter weeks, and so on and so forth. And I I know this is a very difficult um, statement, a different question for people to consider because you know I think most recruitment business owners want their people in to the office most, if not all, of the time. Um, and I think this modern work-life balance issue is uh, is a sticky subject, uh, but it's not impossible. And I think that uh, we have to have a very open mind to how we are going to change the way in which we attract and retain people um, and try and find the balance between what we need and what we expect from our people. And also at the same time, respecting what our people need from us in return. Um, and finding that balance can often be very difficult. We are... And I think it's understandable, we're very much at the beginning of, if you think about the change in work-life balance particularly, there's been a revolution which has really only started pretty much through the COVID era and out, and out the other end of COVID. So it's, we're very much in the infancy of this new work-life structure. There was obviously a lot of talk about it pre-COVID, but COVID changed everything. And it's not a great surprise that people are sort of struggling with this subject matter. I mean, if you go into London now, you'll find... For example, that most people are back in the office at least four days a week. It's more, you know the tubes, the trains are absolutely jammed again. It's exactly as it used to be for most of the week. And you hear about pretty big businesses um, now demanding that their staff come in four or five days a week. So it's a, it's a difficult subject, but I think it's one we have to actually embrace. And you have to think very hard about the policies within your organisation without it affecting productivity. It's interesting. I've written an article on that in this week's uh, our fortnightly newsletter on that subject. You know, the balance of working from home, et cetera, and how 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 companies. And then I've, I've written what I think is a reasonably balanced argument for and against both. 
Uh, so it'd be really interesting what people think on that. But you're right. I think that is a really evolving situation and i don't think we've got anywhere near what the what the perfect view would be whether it's full in the office hybrid working out of the office and i think that's going to go on for some time and you know it's down to the each, each to their own and i think what heather said earlier is obviously if that is then curtailing the pool that you're fishing in then you've got to think about what you're doing. And if you want to get a more diverse and a more expansive workforce, then you've got to open the gates a little bit to let more people in. And I think that's a really interesting sort of conversation to have. And we could probably have a whole webinar on that whole conversation. We could, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, we could have a week of uh, webinars on it. <laughs> steady the steady other thing on is just, just to have a little a small HR, uh, small HR <laughs> thing here is some organizations are really scared of creating uh, remote working flexible working hybrid policies because they don't because they they think they're going to set something in stone you know it's okay to say in your policy this is an iteration of our policy that we're going to try for the next three months and uh, and then we'll review it and it might change you know you don't have to be scared of creating policy that is in effectively in draft form it yeah. doesn't have to be perfect before you pull you publish it and creating that expectation in your workforce that says do you know what this is really difficult for all of us but we're going to keep talking about it until we find something that works for you and for the organization and this is the version of the policy that we're going to work on for the next three months well, and then yeah. iterate it as we go it's a great well, point the other thing sorry just very quickly the other thing is that with technology moving at the pace it's now moving at um uh it's not going backwards so the the ability to connect with others um, without actually physically being next to them is going to improve. I mean, heaven knows what uh, the sort of futuristic Zoom will look like in five, 10 years time and how we'll connect with each other. It's certainly not gonna be the same as it is today. It's going to improve. So yeah. we are, we're going to find ways and means in due course of making work from home, um, remote working and so forth easier and more well, effective. just joined an organization where they don't have an office none of them work in an office there isn't mm -hmm. they all work remotely all the time yeah i'll let you know and i think that's how that worked <laughs> and it's about it's about culture isn't it as yeah. a leader it's about what culture do you want to create and does that culture involve working from home you know it's work yeah you know, i'm a big um you've heard me say i don't like the phrase work-life balance it's life and within our life we work yeah, and it's where is that work best delivered? What is that productivity? And and how satisfied is the person who's working for us about where they're It's working? going to be different for different people. Yeah, it is. you're right. And so it is, that's and what it, we've learned, isn't it? That's different what we've learned through COVID yeah. and through the last three or four years. Different people perform better in different circumstances. It was just that six years ago, seven years ago, the expectation was to, to be good at your job, you had to be sitting next to somebody. And as a manager, I had to be able to see you. And that's so, gone now. So let's move this forward then. So from a recruitment point of view, not from a, a performance point of view. So what key metrics or KPIs do you recommend tracking when evaluating the effectiveness of your recruitment talent acquisition process? Well, there's so many. I mean, Heather's no, no doubt going to jump in. I, I, I mean, every business I work with, we track um, attrition rates. Uh, we look at that monthly, quarterly, annually. We compare periods of time and so forth. And I think that's super important. But of course, when you're looking at that, you're looking at something that's already happened. So, you know, when you're tracking a number like that, that's already, it's a fact. So I think it's about trying to get ahead of whatever that attrition rate's looking like, and that will come down to uh, your policies and procedures regarding um, uh, performance reviews, appraisals, one-to-one uh, -one meetings, and so on. The level of communication that you have, whether that's group or individual within the organization, also, of course, links very carefully to uh, as you said earlier, Howard, about career progression in an organization, people tend to stick if they're moving forward. So what are the career paths looking like? How are you looking at those? How are you developing people, giving them opportunities to grow and your L&D and so forth? I mean, Heather, I'm sure is going to jump in on this, but uh, it's a pretty deep conversation. But as I say, if you only look at the attrition rate, you're looking over your shoulder at what's already happened. I think it's got to be about what you're doing to improve attrition rate, how you're going to keep that at a relatively low number. 
Yeah, the other the other one is speed to competency. So you know, how quickly do the people that you bring into your business become um, become productive and start to pay for themselves? There's some real challenges around targeting managers on retention if you're not linking it to productivity. So when how do you know that you've made a bad hire as opposed to you've not develop them well or you've not matched expectation to reality um you know it's really really complicated so i think you've got to measure loads and loads of things um as paul said you've got to measure how uh, your attraction how how many people are you attracting in the top of the funnel at the beginning how many people who are that you hire are staying with you um sometimes you have you do make bad hires so how often do you make bad hires can you reduce the number of bad hires that you make um we used to do um something where we had targeted retention so we had lists of people that we specifically targeted to retain in the business because otherwise what happens is somebody leaves and the manager then says well i didn't i didn't really want them to stay anyway and they take no ownership for the fact that actually they've failed to retain that person in the business so i think it's really really multi-layered and it's about being very very close to your managers and their teams and your managers expectation of their teams and their trajectory i I you you hire somebody you're invested in their success right so if you then lose them it's very easy to oh they're rubbish anyway well why were they rubbish you believed in them well, you make a great point. I, I stood at a, I stood with you guys last Paul, year at a recruitment Paul. expo. So yes, Paul, let's 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 get get Dave in on that question. Okay. Dave's got something to say. Um, I was just going to say that uh, I think always be hiring and always be referring. Yeah. So so a, a target for me would be each of my staff, whether I've got five or fifty, how many people are they introducing to the business? And it goes back to my earlier point: if they're not introducing anybody. Why not Why? find out? Yeah, because then you, you've got a better chance of retention if you can keep the ones you've got and you know why they're not referring. But I think they're the best ways of that. That, that is a measurement that I would use that we haven't said. You know, get your people referring people. So I'm going to try and answer Ashley's question as well at the same time, yeah. which is, you know, how long do you give people if they're not performing? And so my first answer to that is when you start to look at the metrics that you would lo- use, I look at how many people go through the interview process, how many people reject my interview process. So is my interview process poor? And then when I get people through the interview process, as you were saying, Heather, how quickly can I get people up to speed? So what's my attrition rate in that first part? Okay. And then how many people do I get up to promoted situation? So how fast do I get them promoted and drive them through promotion? And then it's all the other indicators that we talked about there. So the question is not about, you know, how long do I give them if they aren't performing? The question is, first of all, I look at my process. I don't look at my people. So if I've got the wrong person through and they're not performing, why aren't they performing? So is it the manager? Is it the training? Is it the recruitment process? What process broke down? Because Paul and Dave said there, when we recruited them, they were the right people to get through the recruitment process. So if they've got through the recruitment process in the first place, and then they're the wrong person, then it's not the fact that they're the wrong person. There's something wrong with the process. So we've got to address the process first. Yes, we might have to remove that person because they're the wrong person, but we address the process and look at what the process. So I think it's that comment about being process proud but never satisfied and always looking at your processes. So look at the people that have come through your business and succeeded. What process have you put into those? How can you improve that process? If people aren't succeeding, what have we missed? And that probably falls down to a poorer recruitment process or we've become a little bit blasé about our recruitment process and just start to we, loosen the boundaries that we want rather than keeping them really tight. And my comment was always make it a hard place to get into, make it a harder place to get out of. Mm. And I think yeah. that's the bit where it, there's, there's no real true answer to your question, actually. Yeah. Okay. If they're not right, then yes, they have to go. But it's looking at the process, I think, is the bigger question. So the last question before we jump in then. In your experience, what's the most common pitfall or challenge recruitment agencies face when it comes to talent acquisition and how they overcome these obstacles to drive success? 
Well, one of the things I was about to say earlier was the fact that we, we stood at a recruitment expo and listened to a very well-known owner of a recruitment biz, a recruitment training business um, say to about 150 people, uh, recruit two people to get one person. It's two for one. He stood there, said it, and I said, I think I was with you guys, and I, I thought, is that what it's come to, that you're actually prescribing at least a 50% attrition rate? And I think your point, Howard, about the, the, the comments you've just made about step back, because if one in two people or worse than that make the grade, you've really got something wrong with your processes and the way in which you go forward and recruit people. But, you know, the fact is that there is somebody on a stage talking to an awful lot of people saying this is acceptable. It isn't yeah, acceptable. And it really isn't. It really isn't. For, for me, the commonest pitfall is not training um, the people doing the hiring for you. Right. So you really have to understand what it is that you're looking for. What does success look like and what sound like um, and how do you identify it? And then making sure that you've trained people to know how to ask the right questions to get information that's actually going to predict success, whatever the role. Yeah. Whatever, whatever it is that you're bringing them in for. Do you understand what it is? that predicts success and have you trained people in how to spot that? Um, for me, Howard, um, and this is a simple one, I'm amazed at how many companies don't have a recruitment process. They just do interviews and they decide whether they like the person or not and take them on, but they're actually using the process of, you know, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to train you, this is the onboarding, this is what it looks like after three months. They just don't have that because they're good people and they're used to doing interviews and they're building and running their own businesses but they actually just don't have a process in place so when you reflect upon it if it has or hasn't worked they're not sure where it's worked or not because there isn't a process to refer back to it was interesting because yesterday this provoked quite a bit of emotion in mark who's on the the webinar today and he, he sent me a, a reasonable lengthy email ranting and I said, is it a rant or is it just common <laughs> sense that you're talking about the fact that, you know, and his comment was, and I think the analogy just fits beautifully. He said, you wouldn't go to a dentist that's had 10 days worth of training to get your teeth pulled out. So we're expecting our recruiters to deliver a dentist style approach, yeah. but on very, very little training, but also our recruitment to get that person through the door. So I think some of the common pitfalls is that we never change our recruitment process. We don't actually know what good looks like. We don't know what our clients think goods look, goods look like. And therefore, when we come to acquiring people, we base it purely on their skill set of what they've told us in the first half an hour, rather than thinking <laughs> what's their behaviours, what's their values. How many people say, oh, people don't want to stay and do the job. Well, let's investigate what their will to stay and do the job is, because it's not a nine to five job. So are we investigating what their will is? So that value behaviours, will, and then yeah. skill comes into it. And all of those things, I think most recruitment yeah. agencies tend to ignore and just go for the skill. If I walked in and said, hey, look, I'm a million pound biller. Yeah, here's a job straight away. That'd be the end of the interview. But it's, you know, finding the right behaviors, the right value alignment. Have they got the right will to do the job? And then it's the skills. And I think those are the pitfalls that we have. And I think that analogy of you wouldn't go to a dentist that says, look, I've got two days worth of training. <laughs> yeah, Let yeah. me come in. I was going to say, actually, actually, how do you can stop that sentence with, you wouldn't go to a dentist. What is, <laughs> what is this thing that you refer to? I was going to say you could go to a barber, but then for the three of us, that's a, that's a pointless that could exercise. Be a challenge, yes. <laughs> yeah, be a challenge. So that's it for today. So thank you very much. It's been a really interesting conversation. Next week, we're going to push this little this series on a little bit more. We're going to look on: Do your management team lead performance consistency? Or are you still on that roller coaster boom and bust? So it's about what we talked about today, about setting the right expectations for people when they get through the business. So do you know what that break-even point is? Do you know how to get them to perform? Do you know what the KPIs are? Are they killing you, et cetera, et cetera? So all of these things we're going to touch. And then the week after that, we're going to bring a trainer in and talk about training our people properly so we've got some really good webinars coming up so feel free to join us enjoy the rest of valentine's day if you haven't got my card i'm awfully sorry uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's in the post uh and yeah. i look forward to seeing you all next week happy valentine's day to you happy valentine's day everybody take care <laughs>